actually welcome to China Studio. I have my own YouTube channel um, that it's um, talking about ballet and give a lot of younger dancers t um, ballet tips. And that's mm -hmm. when we saw the video, me and Giovanni filming and talking about Balanchine and Vaganova. And I saw your comment because I actually deactivate my Facebook, but Giovanni told me about that you're very pleased with what we did. And I was very interesting to, you know, to talk to you and getting to know you a little bit more. Um, sure. Yeah, and yeah, my name is Chen Wei Chen. I'm principal with New York City Ballet. Um, Congratulations. My, Congratulations. Thank you so much, John. This is my second year in the company and I have been enjoying all the repertoire here a lot. I'm enjoying the city. My colleagues, they are all amazing. Um, yes, and so oh, could you please introduce yourself a little bit? You, if you want, you can introduce yourself in Chinese. Uh, yeah, my Chinese is not that good. All I know is Gong Shi Fa Gong Shi Fa Cai. Gong Shi Fa Cai. Yes, Gong Shi Fa Cai. We, we, say yes. that, we say that every, you know, every, uh, new, yeah, every new year. And well, my company, my company performed in Taipei uh, and also Taichung when it was New Year's. So I learned how to say that and said hello to the public. <laughs> Amazing. My, my bad Chinese. But um, yeah, and then I've also, you know, I staged some balancing for the um, National Ballet Academy in Beijing and taught there. So I've had some relations in China. And then my Casablanca. Have you seen my video of Casablanca? No, I haven't yet, but I will do some research. And you can, can you send me the link, please? I'll send you the link. Yeah. Um, it's uh, Warner Brothers uh, commissioned me, or actually I went to Warner Brothers and I did a big ballet version of the film Casablanca. And uh, they paid my company $4.6 million to do it. So, so far I think I've got, I've had the biggest budget of any ballet <laughs> I think ever in existence. Congratulations. And, uh, yeah, well, that's a long time, it was a years ago. And we did it uh, for the opening of the uh, yearly drama festival in Beijing at the Great Hall of the People. Wow. And it's a, I'll tell you some stories about that. Um, in the, uh, you know, it's paid for obviously by the Chinese government, you know, and, yeah. uh, Warner, and Warner Brothers, because at that point in time, Warner Brothers was trying to make contracts with China for all the movies because they had all these bootleg DVDs on the street, right? You, you know how that, you know how they do it. No. And so Warner Brothers, and there's a lot of movie theaters in China, you know, I mean, it's big shopping malls. I mean, it was amazing, you know. And um, so the Chinese public evidently knew the film Casablanca. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know that, but that was evidently a popular film in China. And so um, as a kind of a political thing, Warner Brothers said, OK, we'll do the premiere of my Casablanca originally to be at the Shanghai Opera House uh, when it was being built. It was the brand new Shanghai Opera House. But mm -hmm. the mayor of Beijing was not happy that the premiere would take place in Shanghai. Right. Because there's like a rivalry between the cities. Yes. It's it's kind of like New York and Los Angeles, yep. <laughs> you know, or Los Angeles and San Francisco even more. But um, <laughs> so we had to do the premiere in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And we only had three days of performances. But, you know, it's 10,000 seats, the Great Hall of the People. Right. And so they only opened up the bottom half, the 5,000 at the bottom. Uh -huh. But we had so many people that had to open the balcony. Oh, wow. So we had we had about 7,500 people each show. That's a big and, success. Yeah, it was a big success there. And then the problem, though, <laughs> is that the Shang we were supposed to do the three performances in Beijing and immediately go down to Shanghai for seven weeks of performances in the Opera House. Because the Opera House only had 1,000 seats. Right. So it wasn't so big. The stage was beautiful. I went there to look at it when it was being finished and they have elevators and they have everything you could imagine. So we were really looking forward to having those all those performances in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. But and we don't know how much was political. Yeah. But all of, a, all of a sudden, the Shanghai Opera House said they would not be open in time. Uh oh, uh, and they had posters of us in the lobby of the Shanghai Opera House. Right. And that announcing Casablanca was coming, you know, April, whatever. So Warner Brothers said, okay, well, let's just do the three performances in Beijing. Let's just do it there. We have the production, big success, standing ovations, Amazing. and the audience stayed, you know, through the whole show. And we were told that they basically know the song as time goes by, 
Uh -huh. So after that song, maybe some of the audience would leave, you know, whatever. But they stayed for the whole show. Every performance. Wow. So the biscuit success. And then everything went bad because um, we were supposed to, we came back to America. And this was all with my company. I put together a company to do this. You know, I had my old Los Angeles ballet. You know, Damien was in my old company. You know, Damien Wetzel was in my old LA ballet. And um, and Darcy Kistler was from our school, you know, mm -hmm. so. But um, <laughs> so we had a, a U.S. promoter. Mm -hmm. This is, inter I think this might be interesting for your audience too, <laughs> to find yeah. out how things work or don't work. So we had a big U.S. promoter who was the promoter for Riverdance. Remember Riverdance? Mm -hmm. Of course. And that was a big success, you know, and Riverdance toured all over and made a lot of money, etc. Well, this promoter, the impresario, actually was stealing. Ah. So so he he signed up my company and Warner Brothers all to a 36 wow. week tour, 36 week tour of Casablanca. Right. Uh -huh. So we thought, okay, everything is wonderful. We're going to go out on tour. But he, I don't know all the details, but he got investigated by the SEC, our government, for taking money for one show, putting it into another show, not paying the investors. Oh, oh my God. So it was kind of like the movie, The Producers. Yeah. It was yeah. a little bit like this. And so he disappeared. And what age were you that time? Oh, this was like... Uh, uh 40 something okay because i saw online that um I you think... you 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 quit new york city ballet at age 27 and I, i'm very interested right it, it, am i correct it was the internet right no 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 that's right i joined new york city ballet when i was 19 uh-huh and i made eight ballets for the company uh -huh. you made a ballet already well balanchine wanted me there as a choreographer and then he liked me as a dancer, but he brought me from Los Angeles to be a choreographer. Wow. And and so I choreographed at the school. I made a couple ballets for the school. And then within a month, he took me into the company because he didn't really like my dancing. Thank uh -huh. God. So, so so I did choreograph and was a principal dancer with the company. I was the youngest. I was the youngest male principal dancer. And um, and I was in the company before Peter Martins joined. Uh -huh. And I was in the company before Helgi Thomason. Uh -huh. And I was in the company about three years before Jerry Robbins came back uh -huh. and did dance at a gathering. Okay. And I was in, I, I was the original giggle dance uh -huh. in dance. And then he choreographed most of Valella's parts on me because Valella was touring a lot and doing concerts. He had to make a lot of money because he had a bad divorce. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Eddie was out there, you know, making a lot of money. Uh, Amazing. I, and so what makes you want to, get out of the company at age 27, you were well, super young. Yeah, well, it also was, it was very stupid. I, I say this on my Instagram all the time um, because Balanchine was- Oh yeah, by the way, I, I want to put your Instagram handle right here. So all my audience want to follow um, John's Instagram. It's right here that he always posts a lot of uh, good video. Of uh, old life. stuff, old stuff. Yeah old stuff i don't have access to new stuff <laughs> people people say to me why don't you post any of the new dancers and i said i don't have any access to that you know when you work with balanchine like um how is balanchine like as a person and well what did makes you read my book <laughs> did yeah, you read my book did you I read have my book? Read your book okay well i go into a lot of details that nobody else has talked about uh -huh. um and the people like the audio version actually better because I, I talk, I do the audio version. And it's uh, it's called uh, research Bal about it. Yeah, Balanchine's Apprentice from Hollywood to New York and back. And it's on Amazon and you can find it, you know, Amazon bookstores. Cool. I think Target was carrying it <laughs> at one point. Amazing. So, yeah, and it came out in last September. So it's not even been a year, but it's got very good reviews. I'm very happy and it's selling well. But in that book, I cool. really go into details about Balanchine's character, and uh, which was completely opposite of Robbins. <laughs> you know, they were like, I call him the devil, God and the devil. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Twyla Tharp said the most amazing thing about Balanchine once. She said, she said, she said, to put it simply, this is Twyla Tharp. Mm -hmm. She said, Balanchine is God. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's what she said. And I thought that was okay. You know, I'll buy it. <laughs> and also, I saw your comment in the um, Facebook that you were saying that we were talking about why Balanchine, uh, we, 
we were talking about what Balan Chin wanted, and mm-hmm. we have not talked about why Balan Chin wanted. Can you give some example of what's the what's the well uh, well Balan Chin in class always would give examples and he would use um, alliterations. In other words, he he would get you to do what he wanted you to do, but not talk about the technique. What do you mean? For example, uh, for a port de bras. Okay. Right? A forward port de bras. Forward port de bras. You didn't just bend your body and go down the arm. You mm-hmm. you went down to pick something up. Ah. Uh... You go down. You look. He would say it's money. Okay. He say you see oh money and you go down and you pick up the money and you bring it up, and then you throw it over your head for for back port de bras. So he would always use like if you if you. Um, so you have to visualize something to do every single step. Yeah, and so the, the the fun about his class was what he came up with to make you do it right. So in other words, he didn't tell you point your feet. He'd say push on an accelerator. Oh wow! Okay. He'd say like you have an MG, you have a sports car, you have a MG, right? Uh-huh. That was that was his period sports car MG. So like a saute or something like that. No, dear, don't just jump. You push. Like you push down on gas pedal, like accelerator, you know. Mm. So he he would always come up with all these wonderful little phrases. But the only time that I heard, or I think anybody ever heard Balanchine take apart every single step from demi pied, grand pied, porter, when he really explained why was during his seminar in 1967. He did a week long seminar of two hour classes, right? Mm-hmm. And this was paid for by the Ford Foundation. And a hundred ballet teachers from across America flew to New York, mm-hmm. stayed in a hotel, all paid for by Ford Foundation. Mm-hmm. And he would teach the company. Well, it, it was during the week layoff before Saratoga. So it was, if you wanted to take the class, you could, but it wasn't mandatory, right? So, so there were only about 16 of us that took every day. Wow. And he taught like five or six classes for a hundred teachers. And that's where, he explained the demi plie to a grand plie and mm-hmm. why you don't stop in demi plie. And because the muscles react a different way. And everything that Balanchine was doing was to get you to learn how to dance, not just do a series of pretty poses. So a lot of it, I found that a lot of the Vaganova okay. training, a lot of the Vaganova training is to make perfect poses. And then you put them together. Balanchine came at it completely opposite. Mm. It was everything he taught and the way he put steps together in class was to be dancing. That's why there was so much attention to glissade. Balanchine would spend a whole class on glissade. Yeah. Because and nobody does it right anymore. I'm sorry, but not, it's it's too big now. It's too wide. It's got to yeah. be small. But anyway, because, right. I mean, it's true. Like with my experience after I joined your city ballet, mm-hmm. I do feel that in in the bar, there's some poses I cannot hold as long as pretty in a way as before. But certainly, I perform better on stage. I'm able to dance with yes. all the training I have here. Yeah, and the Vaganov is good up to a point. You know, I mean, Vaganov training is very good basic training up to a point. But what Balanchine did was he took a lot of Bournemouth. You know, Balanchine was ballet master for Royal Danish Ballet for one year. After Diaghilev died, mm-hmm. Balanchine went to Denmark and he did his ballets, but he also taught company class. He was the ballet master. So he when he and I used to go out to dinner a lot privately. You know, I had a relationship with Balanchine private, mm-hmm. not just in the theater. But he took me out to dinner every night, and he'd get drunk with me, and he taught me how to drink wine. And like, but he would tell me things he didn't tell the company, uh-huh. because he was a little bit more in the company was work. You know, but when Leader, he took me out, yeah. when he, when he took me out to dinner, it was like, oh boy, you know, it's crazy. But, <laughs> but he a lot of his a lot of his Russian training imperial imperial he'd like to say imperial training he colored that with some of his uh bourninville okay i could tell a little bit definitely did balanchine like influence your foundation of um los angeles ballet oh yeah are you kidding (laughs) amazing so in 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 what way and how so well first off when i came to los angeles i i would come to uh, like for two weeks during the summer because this was my home and during vacation, you know, New York City Ballet used to have a six week summer break. So I'd come to Los Angeles and I would teach class for my my teacher, Irina uh-huh. Kosmoska, who was also Damien's teacher later. Okay. And she was very much like Tunkowski, really tough. 
the classes were like, oh my God, you know, they were so hard, but that's what you need. You know, you need mm -hmm. the, then you don't get injured. If you have a hard class, you get used to a hard class, you don't get injured. Simple. If you have an easy class, you jump into a balancing ballet, you get injured. So the so tips for everyone, we got to take a hard class. In you order must. To about. You must, especially if you're dancing balancing repertory. Ah. You know, especially the girls on point, you know, because, <clears throat> uh, you know, when Meryl Ashley was coming up, she was weak. Mm -hmm. And you, it's hard to believe Meryl Ashley was once weak. Yeah. But she was weak and she was a very good friend of mine. I knew her since she was 14. I love her. Uh -huh. oh, wonderful, wonderful. And But when Balanchine first gave her her first solos, it was the tall girl in Divertimento 15. Uh -huh. You know, bomb, yeah. bomb, 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 bomb. And Meryl, she had a bad ankle and she didn't want to tell Balanchine, you know, she wanted to do it, but she wasn't strong enough for him. You know, and I, he said, he it's said, something, believe. he said, I know, he said something kind of tough to her. He said, I'll tell you, he said, you're a big girl, dance like big girl. He wanted big. And she was, you know, again, she was very young and she was very timid around balancing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people were because he was balancing. So some people were like afraid, you know. But what she did was the smartest thing she could do. Mm -hmm. She immediately started taking all the classes she could with Tumkowski. Oh. And Meryl was already in the company dancing, you know. She wasn't a soloist. She was still, you know, young. But when Balanchine said, you got to get stronger, bigger, she, she was smart. She went to Tumkowski's class at night and she killed herself. And she got strong. Mm -hmm. And the first, and I, I take a little credit here, because the first time Meryl showed the company uh -huh. that she could do something big, yeah. for, the, for the Stravinsky Festival, Balanchine wanted me to choreograph Stravinsky. So I did this symphony in E flat, which is like 40 minutes long, 45 uh -huh. minutes, big, big score. It's a symphony, big. Score. It sounds like Rimsky Korsakoff because it was very early Stravinsky was like opus one or two or something. So, and originally I was going to use different principles, but Balanchine was not happy with Gelsey then. And he was not happy with Peter Martins then. So he asked me to use Peter and Gelsey in the whole ballet, the whole four <clears throat> movement, wow. which, I, which I was not going to do. I was going to split it up, you know, yeah. but. He said, no, no, use, use Peter, Gelsey. I don't want to use them. Don't, you use them. And I went, oh, all right. Whatever. <laughs> and I, I got along with Peter. You know, we were friends then. And Gelsey was difficult because she was already in her brain going off. You know, she was fighting Balanchine all the time. It was ridiculous. <laughs> but um, so I did this very big ballet. And it was very hard technique because Gelsey was, you know, amazing technique. But then Gelsey didn't want to go to Saratoga uh -huh. for this performance. She was like, little looped so she decided to stay in new york and i gave meryl that role okay but because it was my choreography meryl was not shy mm. see what i mean yeah she wasn't afraid because we were good friends right a lot of jumps including the grand chute kick the head yeah that she doesn't follow right which is not a typical balancing step yeah that's that's a bold choice step yeah yeah so it's very unusual to see so, but that was the step I had in my Stravinsky and Meryl nailed it. Amazing. And she, she actually, that was the first time because everybody was talking that they really saw this new strength and this bravura and this, you know, you know, and Peter was excellent partner. So Meryl felt very comfortable with Peter and he was tall enough for her. So she felt good. Okay. And she just, she slayed it. And Balanchine came, came up to me after the performance and he said, you know, dear, what did you do to her? One more last question. So okay. what do you think he would say to the younger generation if he's still here um, to, uh, for the dancers today? <laughs> Don't butter the bacon. For Balanchine, the music came first. So the tempi has to be correct, mm -hmm. at least correct for Balanchine, right? Which is generally pretty fast, you know? So music first, you never slow down, you never do anything to make yourself feel good. You dance the music tempo. So just, okay, I got it now. Yeah, and we weren't allowed to speak to the conductors. We couldn't go up to the conductor and say, "Oh, maybe in the coda can we have a little?" You know, that was forbidden. We never could speak. We could talk to the conductor, but we could never say anything like, "Can you do anything with the music?" Uh, no, no, no. And oh, oh. and uh, no, Balanchine set the tempo. The conductors respected Balanchine because he was a very good musician, you know, and. 90% of the time, his tempo was 
musically very correct. Mm -hmm. So the conductors loved working for Balanchine. And uh, so number one was the music. Number two is the choreography. For most ballets, especially Balanchine and Robbins, but Balanchine, you don't have to act the choreography. So you don't change the step for the choreography? You don't have to act. You don't have to put on a... Oh, you don't have to act. You don't have to act because it's in the, the drama is in the choreography. And the other thing I see happening a lot uh, everywhere, but in New York City Ballet, which bothers me, I'll be honest, uh -huh. is too much rubato. In other words, too much slowing down or speeding up in the middle of the choreography. Okay. You know what rubato is? For a musician, it's like when you take time and then you speed up and then you slow down, you know, it's very emotion, you know, it's emotion and it's emotive, you know, Right. And I see this happening more and more that the dancers, I think it's because everybody's technique is so good now. <laughs> but I, I do. I think it's a, it's a thing that when you have very, very good technique, you feel you're not doing enough. Uh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I'm not mad at the dancers. So if uh -huh. New York City Ballet looked at this, I'm not mad at the dancers. Uh -huh. But they don't understand that they don't have to do more. And I'll give you two good examples. Walls of the Flowers, mm -hmm. the exit of the dewdrop. Yeah. <clears throat> she should do the PK arabesque on the count of eight. Right. Now they all do it on the count of one of the next phrase. Right. Because <clears throat> they want to do more chenets. Uh huh. That's not the choreography. Mm. The girl has to hit eight and go because the court of ballet starts on one. Mm. And if awesome. she's doing a relevé on one, it bleeds for the audience into the core. The core. And that's not respectful of the choreography. Mm. If you look at the 1993 film with Kira Nichols, yeah, or anything before that, she does the PK on eight. Eight, got you. Always respect the original choreographies. Well, why change it? Yeah. Don't butter the bacon. Okay, awesome. great. Thank you so much, and thank you all the audience that is watching this um episode, and thank you, John, for joining us. Um, sure. Yeah, I would love to talk to you about it more. Thank you. Please subscribe. If you have any question, please comment below. Um, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Sure.